architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. We're in the midst, uh, actually drawing towards the end of a long conversation we've been having on architecture in the time of coronavirus. We have been doing this for almost two and a half months now. And while we are entering into the sixth, seventh month of the epidemic here in the United States, uh, the summer is also drawing on. And now that we are in August, uh, I am going to start winding down uh, this series on architecture and coronavirus. All this to say that uh, if you have noticed, uh, we have been releasing our podcasts weekly uh, and now onwards uh, as the academic year starts to gear up, we will be reverting to our normal schedule of a podcast every other week. Uh, to round out our discussion on architecture in the time of coronavirus, today I'm speaking to two people uh, and they both come from what might be considered to be compared to most of the perspectives outlined in this podcast from the more mainstreams of architectural practice here in the United States. Uh, Rachel Minery is the uh, Director of Built Environment Policy at the AIA, the American Institute of Architects in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking to her about resilience and AIA and its thoughts on the virus and her own life in that context. And I'm talking to Patrick McLean, who is the retired CEO of HOK, uh, the famous firm uh, with an extensive portfolio of practices. And he is giving his virus his perspective on how a firm, a large firm, small firm, I guess, uh, can deal with the challenges posed by a situation such as the virus with its enforced uh, action on projects and on working from home. Uh, I hope you enjoy these conversations and I will see you in a couple of weeks. All right, Rachel, thank you for being on Architecture Talk and having this conversation with me. Thank you for having me. You are the Senior Director of Resilience, Adaptation, and Disaster Assistance at the AIA. Couldn't you have added a few more big titles there? I mean, what else? <laughs> <laughs> Resilience, Adaptation, and Disaster Assistance. Those are three huge, big portfolios, it seems to me. Rather than explain your job, can you tell me just conceptually, what is the relationship between disasters, perhaps adaptation, but certainly what is the relationship between disaster and resilience? Shouldn't we be resilient outside of disasters? So what is the, why do, why do those two things closely linked together? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the AI's work and and that is maybe one example of how people have gotten into what some refer to as the resilience movement. At, at AIA, or actually for a number of decades, architects have either within their own communities or their regions reached out and offered support to communities that are trying to recover and rebuild after disasters. And by, let's say, 2005, so we had the tsunami in Southeast Asia. We then had Hurricane Katrina and then a number of tornadoes uh, and floods, et cetera, et cetera, in very short order. And, and increasingly, you know, this just seems to be the new normal. That's right. Increasing in scope, severity, and as we're building up more and more our communities and increasing population, we just have more to lose. And so, frequency, yeah. And frequency, yep. And 
as architects, we have to kind of sit back and say, well, how do we get ourselves out of the disaster business and, and into more of the safety business so that the buildings that we are designing are first located in less risky places. And then second of all, are, are built to withstand um, the impacts of these shocks. And so that that more or less has been the trajectory for us is looking not just about how we continue to go through the cycle of getting hit and rebuilding and over and over again. And how do we get out of that and start focusing on how we can design our community so that they can withstand these shocks. So is that what resilience is, being better able to withstand disasters? It is in part. So this is where my... My, my job title isn't everything but the kitchen sink title um, because they're in in the resilient circles. There's criticism about proposing the idea of resilience, which in and of itself means to bounce back from. But for some communities going back to what they have, it wasn't working in the first place. So we don't always want to bounce back. And in, for example, locations where they're having repeated flooding, again, it doesn't make sense to keep exposing ourselves to the same hazard over and over again. So that's where this notion of adaptation comes in, which is really about having foresight and thinking about the longer term and what really makes the most sense in, in terms of where you're choosing to, to design and build buildings. Yeah, wouldn't that be a good idea to simply not run into disasters? And wouldn't that be the real ultimate resilient strategy? Yes, exactly. The counter argument to resilience and investing in resilience is that in order to achieve a high payback, it means that you have higher exposure, higher risk exposure. And so, yes, ultimately, the idea is that you don't need to be resilient because you're not affected by any of these shocks or stresses. You seem to distinguish in your writing uh, between sustainability and resilience. Uh, what is the connection and what is the difference between those two concepts at a high level? Yeah, at a high level, they, they're really under the same banner. I mean, generally speaking, it's about making choices today that take into consideration the needs of today, but also the needs of tomorrow. And um, yet at the same time, the sustainability movement has gained a lot of traction because they've had a great economic case to make for that. You know, if we save energy, we save water, we save money. And resilience, oftentimes investing in resilience isn't really about saving money, or at least for first cost. It's about reducing your chance of having to spend it later. So it's really more about risk avoidance than it is about being about being efficient. So life cycle costing can some ways connect to the long term investment strategies of resilience. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. Uh, but uh, it also seems to me that uh, just from a non specialist perspective, that resilience is a more uh, life sympathetic concept for me than sustainability. I mean, it seems to me sustainability is about making things work perfectly, harmoniously, ecologically, well-balanced, cyclically. Whereas it seems to me that life is inherently shot through with uncertainty and the inevitability of things that you're not expecting to happen, happening. So building strategies that uh, help us prepare for the unexpected is a more sustainable way of thinking about things, which is to say a resilient way of thinking than thinking about the perfect way to live with nature. Uh, what do you think about that concept? Yeah, I. I think that's spot on. You know, I think every movement that has built upon the initial sustainability movement that was really focused on environmentalism, but since then, sustainability has really expanded. You see all kinds of modifiers, social sustainability and social responsibility that get at some of these more 
community equity factors and vulnerable populations. Um, Mm -hmm. And resilience, you know, I, I guess one of the things that I like about it is it realizes that when we only focus on the environment, for instance, we, we miss the boat where we put blinders on to other issues, challenges, problems. Certain strategies might negatively impact others. So let's say, for instance, you know, one of my classic examples is a sustainability strategy for stormwater infrastructure. And when you design, for example, bioswales to treat and slow down the absorption of of rainwater, stormwater. And when you think about that in the off chance that we have an extreme flood or extreme rainfall, what is the capability of that nicely designed bioswale to be able to accommodate that that surge of of stormwater? I mean, I think, you know, one of the things about resilience and the question of preparing for disasters that intrigues me is that, of course, one can design for known disasters. I can design for a cloud burst. I can design for a possibly for a tornado. I can possibly design for a tsunami or here in Seattle, a major earthquake. But part of the lessons we have learned from life is that disasters can take the form of things that we do not know, things that we cannot pre-expect. And uh, how does one design for things we don't know? How do we build resilience into our cities and in our living systems to prepare for the unexpected or the unknown? Yeah, and I think maybe part of what you might be getting at with this is, you know, sometimes we call it the double disaster or the secondary hazards and cascading consequences. So every state and and most larger cities or metropolitan areas has a hazard mitigation plan. And they've gone through a very scientific exercise to look at what the threats are in their region and then right. what the probability is of that hazard event occurring, um, what the impact might be, and then um, the frequency of which it would occur. So all of that amounts to kind of a, a risk characterization. And so all of these risks get ranked in terms of uh, what the potential impact is. And the I think the challenge is that we don't always know about where our interdependencies will succeed or where they will fail us. So in, in buildings, we can we can work with our structural engineers to design a very robust and stout building that can resist movement or impacts of winds, et cetera. But we can't necessarily guarantee that the electric company and the communications company will be able to service that building with power and internet. So these types of interdependencies are part of kind of what goes into the resilience equation. Um, We have a saying that says a resilient building and a non-resilient community isn't isn't resilient. So resilience really brings out this notion that you need to work in partnership. You need to work in collaboration uh, with other sectors and other industries in order to arrive at kind of you know, what, what we might call community expectations. You know, what are the, the cost benefits of achieving a certain level of, you know, community performance, if you will. What I'm hearing you say is that the real expectation of collaboration about interdependencies, what you call interdependencies, in one sense is desired, but in another sense, it must recognize that it is such a large world that the inevitability of weak links in the chain has to be prepared for. Is that, right. what, what do you think? So recently we, we published a business continuity planning guide for architects. And as part of the process of developing this guide, I, I learned a lot more about where there's a never ending supply of risks out there. Uh, let's just say that. And um, mm-hmm. when you're assessing what, what your risk is to any given business or building, um, sometimes it means you really need to look pretty far out. 
Um, you know, we'll take the, the COVID crisis, for instance, and where we get our supply of, of medical equipment. And so at times, what we'll find is that when you really have an important piece of that supply chain is that you need to trace back to the risks in those areas of where those supplies or raw materials are sourced. So uh, resilience is a never ending uh, research expedition uh, when you really want to plan effectively. Yeah, it, I think the point that I'm trying to get to is that the ambitions of resilience are so massive, so interdependent, so interconnected with so many uncertainties in the system that uh, you, what does it mean to plan? I mean, the idea of plan, you know, since I'm a uh, card carrying modernist, so I will confess that up front. Plan seems to suggest that, uh, you know, you know what are the problems and therefore you can uh, make a plan for it. But when you are dealing with uh, a hope and expectation that is so gigantic and so dispersed across community, how do you plan? There are a few rules of thumb. And uh-huh. I think, you know, when we talk about community resilience, this might sound counterintuitive, but the answer to interdependencies is just to not have them. Um, so the more that we can design and prepare ourselves to be self-sufficient during a downtime, the better we are to withstand a variety of hazards, even if we don't know what they're going to be. Wow. So you're making an argument for... Uh... Uh, reducing interdependencies? Everybody becoming self-sufficient equals, let's just say, to push that, uh, we should all become our own island? No, I wouldn't I wouldn't go to, so far to that end of the spectrum, but I have another mantra that I use, and that is redundancy is resiliency. So as one mode breaks down or isn't working properly, you've got a backup plan. And um, it doesn't mean that you're going to, to live or to function up to your ideal standard, but can you get by? Um, uh-huh. right. can, can you cope during those periods? So we build redundancy into our systems and we try and uh, build as much collaboration into our interdependencies. Yeah. I mean, when I think about those things, I think about, you know, India where I grew up. And I think about the kind of communities that sort of learned to survive by themselves, particularly in slums, because there was nobody watching out for them. There was really, even the city governance didn't really care about them. But because there was no externalities that they could, you know, sue, they developed modalities of survival, which I would call extremely resilient. They lived a constant state of disaster, I would say. So I guess, what is more resilient? I mean, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a community, I mean, are we here in Seattle, do you think way more resilient than your average slum in Colombia or Southeast Asia? I think you're asking a really, powerful question. Um, And that kind of takes us back to our ability to survive on the planet as human beings. And Mm -hmm. the more sophisticated our our cultures and our societies become, the more they specialize. And the more they specialize, the more they lose general skills. Um, You know, if something really devastating were, were to take place, how would we, how would we be able to come together and support each other? Um, and I think part of the question that you're asking too is related to community values and what we value, um, and how that drives the the decisions and and even the policy by which we enable certain populations to survive better than others. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about the current COVID situation that we find ourselves in. And I, for one, 
like I think most people around me in my community, certainly in my university and so on, have have completely surrendered all my agency to the big institutions of state. Yeah, this has been a really interesting, um, I don't mean to sound insensitive, but it, it's been interesting as an observer of the crisis and how it's being managed to see that as a nation, uh, this is the first national disaster that I think has ever occurred in my lifetime or in most people's lifetimes. And we have never had such freedoms, if you will. Uh, leaving your house is a, <laughs> isn't a freedom that, that many people are enjoying right now uh, taken away from us. And yet we have all rallied around, most of us, I should say, have rallied around the shared goal that preserving the health and safety, especially of our older and more vulnerable populations, is, is a priority. And when we sort of recognize it as that and see how much we are valuing our, our, our fellow human beings and, and Americans, then it starts to put everything else into perspective. And those sacrifices don't feel as harsh when we know that we're, that we're helping one another through that process. Um, but at the same time, every state is also handling this very differently from, you know, the more capitalist approach where individual business owners are going to have to determine uh, the protocol by which they reopen up their buildings and, and occupy them to other places that are still and will probably continue to for some time recommend that people stay at home. But the lack of, I think the lack of data that we have on this particular virus is, I think, one of those uncertainties that you speak of. It's one thing to plan for this notion that infectious disease and pandemics are a risk. And I, I did go back to the city of Seattle hazard mitigation plan to see where this ranked. And it was number seven on the list of hazards for Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, but you never know what that's going to look like. You don't know what the virus is going to be, how it's transmitted. Wow. And so there are so many characteristics of what that entails um, that I would imagine, I'm not a public health expert, that that could be very complicated to try to plan for. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a fantastic test case of resilience. Uh, you said that uh, an epidemic showed up as whatever, number seven on, on that um, uh, hazards uh, assessment list. You know, so what could we have done or what should we do prepared thinking of, of the future in our disciplines, architecture, urban design, planning, landscape, you know, real estate, construction, the built environment industries? What can we do? I think uh, there's certainly a couple of things. I think one, more broadly, there is a call to action for architects to think about the impacts of, I've uh, been referring to anything outside of your garden variety disaster, meaning not our typical flood, hurricane, uh, windstorm, tornado. And thinking outside the box about how these other hazards could potentially impact the built environment. Um, traditionally, I think most architects would say, oh, uh, infectious disease, that's a public health issue. Right. Um, and I don't want to say every architect thinks that way, but it can, be very, it can be a very abstract problem to try to address without more information. And yet, here we find ourselves in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis where every single building in the country has been affected. Most of them are not occupied, or in some cases, our homes are overly occupied. <laughs> um, right. and, and that really is a call to action for us to really think about, well, what does it mean to live in a future environment where we are expecting with climate change 
um, more disease, more um, volatility, if you will. And the and with that volatility, uh, I think we need to, you know, we need to take certain measures that allow us to protect the health of occupants in in a safer way. So in you know, we just went through a big movement where this idea of open offices and collaboration amongst different classrooms and schools are really important. So there's this big push to community and collaboration, which is fantastic. Yet when it comes to a situation like this, where we need to social distance, um, most buildings are not are not set up for that. Um, so it really is, I think in many respects, a call for more adaptability and flexibility mm-hmm. within our buildings. There were healthcare folks on our call today. They would say yes. And because, uh, we have a really lean and, and mean, uh, capacity issue for, for beds and hospitals, how do we accommodate for, for surge? We need better strategies to be thinking about these, uh, un- unusual times and unusual days and how we plan for those alternatives. Yeah, I like that. Flexibility and adaptability. I mean, those seem to be two fantastic uh, principles by which uh, I could run a couple of studios at the University of Washington to say, because this is going to happen, right? As we come out of the virus everybody's going to run studios, you know, conceptual or academic mm-hmm. studios at least, on how to prepare uh, mm-hmm. and how should architecture have responded. You know, and I would add that the, the, the lessons that we learned from that are going to help us. You know, Jisa, this is a good testing ground or test case. Uh, not if, but when we have the big one on the West Coast and we lose a certain percentage of our buildings there may be a larger community effort to take a step back and say, okay, well, given the buildings that we do have that are still standing and are safe to reoccupy, how do we collectively as a community want to utilize those buildings and repurpose them for other uses? So I wouldn't be surprised if if we do get to a point where we're starting to think about the the adaptive uses of, of buildings after other kinds of disasters as well. Though it seems to me those are fundamentally different kind of uh, disasters. Uh, I mean, an earthquake or a tsunami that significantly physically destroys instru- infrastructure provokes the response, well, we got to find a way to build it back and just do it better and make sure we are not as vulnerable next time, like you were saying earlier. Whereas a pandemic, it doesn't physically destroy nothing. It just renders it useless. It feels like a different kind of a different category of disaster, does it not? Yeah. Yeah, where it isn't, you know, the work that I do at the AIA, our disaster assistance program is rooted in the notion that we provide specialized training to architects, engineers, and building officials to evaluate the damage to buildings after a disaster um, to determine whether or not they're safe to reoccupy. In this case, yeah, you're exactly right. The buildings aren't damaged. But, but they're not safe to occupy. They're, they're almost accomplices, really, in, in the transmission of the disease to a certain extent. And I think better understanding how uh, the virus lives on certain surfaces will tell us a lot about what choices we might make in materials in the future in our buildings between, you know, hard surfaces and carpeting, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and also our ventilation systems, I think, are, are probably going to have, are going to gain a lot more attention uh, in, terms about, uh, in terms of how we design those, and as well as humidity levels that, that seem to be a critical part of the equation. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic thinking. Of course, uh, uh, how do we prepare buildings to not become accomplices or minimize their accomplice quality? Yeah. Uh, is, uh, you know, one is to, you know, social distancing, you know, set up partitions everywhere and make sure nobody 
talks to anybody, which suggests might as well work from home and use Zoom. Uh, but how to design buildings so that they are uh, antibiotic or or better probiotic uh, would be a fascinating challenge. Yeah, it would. The notion of regenerative design. How do how do these become health giving? In the end, yes. How are they? How do they actually help uh, nurture health? rather than become a participant in yeah. in uh, pathologies, production of, like you said, uh, accomplices. Uh, and it seems uh, the medical establishment decided in this pandemic that most of our buildings are health hazards. I mean, every building has a hallway or a corridor or a stairwell and an elevator in it. And when you are trying to social distance six feet, well, that might mean you can get two people in an elevator. Um, But how do you pass someone in a stairwell uh, or in a hallway? So uh, is this a big discussion? Are there conversation cycles brewing in the, uh, across the AIA on, on, on the impact of COVID on architecture? Yes. Yes, definitely. And there are, as it last week, the, the pact of the West Coast states, so Washington, Oregon, and California. And um, the governors came out and said that one of their, I'll I'll call it prerequisites to reopening the economy was a redrawing of floor plans for schools and businesses. So there is a recognition that uh, either through planning or through other operational or behavioral changes that we make in buildings, that we will need to reoccupy buildings safely until the virus is gone. Um, And that might mean reduced occupant load. It might mean additional partitions or um, PPE for all the building occupants or some of them. Um, And we are, you know, the trouble is when you think about what architects do is they they incorporate and um, apply the codes and standards and guidance that is given to them. And in this case, we don't have that. Um, There are no codes or standards that, that, that directly address this. And so many uh, industry organizations are following what the CDC and NIH and, and others are publishing. And I think I would say trying to translate or extrapolate that to impacts within the built environment. I, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of theorizing of what will become of the future of building design after this is all over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of the architects and experts that, that I've been speaking with Um, have all sort of brought to light the issues that were already affecting certain, you know, we'll call market sectors of of buildings before the COVID-19 crisis, such as uh, more and more people going to Amazon or online retailers and the impacts that has had on brick and mortar stores and main streets of, of smaller towns. And so for offices as well, it sounds like some people are are doing really well with this remote working. And so what does that mean for the demands that will be placed on commercial office space in the future? On the flip side, the offices that are provided may want to now have more space so that we can better socially distance and not all be breathing the same air at the same time. So I... I I foresee that architects have a real opportunity throughout this recovery to really be thinking ahead about not not how we go to the opposite end of the spectrum and button up and tighten everything up, um, but to really start to incorporate um, epidemics and health issues into the good work that they're already doing. And how do we make better decisions for the future based on what we now know are risks that could really 
pop up at, at any time. Right. I mean, it seems to me uh, density is going to be, uh, which has long been one of the sort of easy mantras of all our disciplines, is suddenly taking a big hit. Yes. Yeah. And I think to that end, quality of life. Um, I mean, I can imagine how difficult it, it could be as a New Yorker living in a smaller space because real estate is, is expensive and um, probably in a multi-story building. So going in and out to get groceries has a lot of risk associated with it. Um, but not having a yard uh, or other place to access as parks are closed is I think really tough. Well, that's how the suburbs were born in the early 20th century uh, as a response to the basically the diseased nature of the big industrial cities of the 19th century. That's how modernism came into being as a kind of a hygiene practice. Yeah, that's right. And here we are again. Here we are again at the beginning of the 21st century, looking at the same thing. Here, we transition over to our conversation with Patrick McLeamy, former CEO of HOK. Enjoy. Okay, well, welcome to Architecture Talk, Patrick. Thanks for taking the time out to do this. It's uh, my pleasure. Uh, you have, of course, a lot of experience uh, in running a very significant firm, HOK, and you have just published this uh, intriguing book published by Wiley, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People's Stories and Strategies, strategies Behind HOK. Yes. But before we go down deep into HOK's history, uh, I think one must begin by acknowledging these are very interesting times that we are living in with the coronavirus and, yes. and all the social quarantining and the social challenges that are coming with that. Yes. Uh, but certainly a question is uh, the economic future of uh, design firms uh, and uh, the kind of challenges uh, that uh, these kind of uh, situations bring to firms. Now, I know you've written about this and you have some thoughts about this, but let me begin by asking, uh, do you think that this is a, this is a, the, you know, the current crisis that we are going through is uh, one more economic recession, or do you think that this is a recession of a special time with respect to design firms? Well, <clears throat> I think it's both, actually. Um, I do think it's special in that none of us that's living today has lived through a pandemic. Right. Uh, so the idea that we're all sequestered and we're doing social distancing um, makes it very difficult for, um, for practitioners of architecture or anyone that's in almost any kind of business to carry on as usual. So what do you do? So that's the first thing is it's a great challenge for all of us. Uh, I believe this will not last forever, nor right. does any other financial crisis, a recession or other things, a major earthquake or big, big fire. These things all have a timeline. The layoffs seem to be, you know, record numbers. And so that's going to have some serious long term implications that at least what I'm hearing is there's a lot of fear. Uh, I mean, uh, that uh, this is going to produce a significant downturn in the in our industry. Do you do you believe? Yes, that? I think so. If we're in the grip of fear, it's hard to think straight about what to do to overcome the challenge. Indeed, so I, I prefer to think of it as okay. There's some changed circumstance, but what can we do uh, as architects? So uh, let me first list uh, the first thing that clients of architects do. Call my architect and say, please stop work. Right, Bay. right, right. Uh, so what's the strategy? Well, this, the strategy is first, if you're, a, if you're a, a, an owner, a partner, an owner in an architecture firm, you have to have a really good outreach to every single client so you understand exactly which clients will do what. You can yes. certainly talk with your clients about extending a little bit to the end of a phase so you have a a proper closing out of a phase, proper documentation. 
Yeah, so it's it's uh, good to sort of have a dialogue and uh, even educate the client that while this yes makes sense, yeah. then but, you have to say, all right, if I'm used to to having income of a thousand dollars a month, and of the thousand dollars a month, I spend six hundred dollars on payroll, and four hundred dollars on everything else, then um, I have to say, all right, now instead of a thousand a month. Maybe I'm only going to get 500 or 700 or some other number. I have some choices as an owner. The the most obvious one, which is the one I do not recommend, is, well, just call your staff and furlough them. Say, I'm sorry, we can't, we don't have enough work. And so you, you, and you, um, you're out of a job. I'm very sorry. Go apply for unemployment. Um, if you have a little money together uh, and are able to do so, what I recommend is that you pull in everyone's belt, including and starting with yourself. Let's uh -huh. put everyone on, uh, give everyone a, a 25% pay cut temporary. 32 hours, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll continue to pay. You'll continue to get benefits. And we think we have enough money to get through four months, five months, six months of this. And what I promise to you as, as employees, because first you talk to your clients, then you talk to your employees all at once. You do it virtually. If you can't do it in person, as we cannot today. Mm -hmm. And you say, please, let's share this together and we can overcome this together. Let's all right. take this pay cut. Let's everyone work from home. If you don't have your proper setup at home, let's help you get that. And there are ways to do that so that people have the ability to work online from their living room or their bedroom or their kitchen table. And uh, let's continue to work for the, the projects that we have. Mm. And let's continue to take care of our clients and let's stay in good touch with each other and with our clients. We are all family in this. Right. And then what I promise you is the, as the, uh, as the principal or the partner or the owner of the firm, that if we come out on the sunny side of this coronavirus, and the restrictions about uh, working from home are lifted and we can all go back to work, I promise you that we will all work together as hard as we can. And before I get my pay restored, I will make sure that each one of you gets that back pay, that 25% of your pay that mm -hmm. you, um, that you uh, suffered with, uh, that you get that restored, that, you, that we pay you back that piece out of the firm's profits for this year. And mm -hmm. if we can't do it in this year, we'll continue to work on it in Q1 of next year. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is the easy way out is to say, okay, the game is up. I'm out of business. I'm going to lay off all my employees and I'm going to scratch around for my next architecture project once this is over. Mm -hmm. uh, what you have now done with that is you've thrown away the best people that you know, the people that you have hired and trained and people that more importantly know how to work together with you and with others in your firm. And uh, that's the, that talent that you have assembled in your firm is precious. Do everything you can first before you let that talent slip away. Right. right. That's why I say that. Yeah. Okay. And then as this goes through, you cannot communicate too much or too many times with your employees. I think at least once a week, there should be um, uh, some kind of a firm-wide meeting, uh, at least in an email to everyone with an update. Uh, the client such and so, um, good news and bad news. The client such and so has agreed to extend us to the end of design development, but the other client has, has said, no, we want you to stop today. Mm. Tell them the truth. Whatever you do, right. don't try to sugarcoat anything. If right. you really want to build the loyalty of your team, give them the honor of telling them the truth, even when it's difficult. Part of my advice for any firm is to take set aside some piece of profits each month. Don't spend it. Build it up so that that will allow you to cushion the month where the clients don't pay, or if you have enough cash, maybe it will allow you to take advantage of having the money when um, a wonderful employee comes along that uh, 
you need to invest in. You yeah. hire that person who's very good designer or an expert at healthcare or something else, and then you can afford to hire that person. I mean, I think those are good, uh, you know, inv- uh, strategies for, for for the firm. But let's stay with that Corona question uh, a bit, and I, and I and I I share this your optimism that you know this is one more downturn, and uh, sooner or later we will come out of it. So it's stupid to throw away your your intellectual capital with with the times. Yes. But, but let's say longer than shorter period of working remotely and, and developing new ways of working. Do you see that practice in the way we practice that there may be some changes uh, that might that this might result in, in in the way we put practice together, working more remotely or things? Yes, that, that's an excellent question. And uh, I would say emphatically, the answer is yes. Life, life is complicated enough for, you, for young people, especially, who are working, who are juggling maybe a marriage, children, <clears throat> babysitting duties, um, two people in the same house working, uh, some, you know, each sharing, sharing two jobs, and so on. So the ability to give someone the flexibility to work from mm-hmm. home at least part of the time. It's just a good business practice, period. We mm-hmm. did it for two reasons. I think the first one is to help, uh, especially younger people, but actually anyone uh, uh, juggle the, 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 the pressure of a family and a job. Right. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing that we found with a larger firm, people working in multiple offices, that we were able to work to to create virtual teams of people. Whether you were working from home or in your office, it didn't matter. But if a person that was that expert in healthcare was in Dallas and the healthcare project was in Seattle where you are, that person could be a member of the team to serve that Seattle healthcare client. And uh, so HOK began to uh, develop virtual teaming as a business strategy. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was, it was a strategy to put the best people, the best team together for the client so that no matter where the project was, we could basically guarantee the client that they were going to get our very best, most, uh, most qualified people. The other thing we did, and I think this will also be true uh, after the coronavirus, you, you've seen, all of us have seen the growth of these uh, video conference setups like Zoom right, and right. Uh, GoToMeeting and so on. Well, uh, we at HOK were putting a large screen um, uh, teleconferencing setups in large clients' offices, especially if they were uh, in, uh, in across the ocean or somewhere. And we've said, look, instead of meeting you once a month by flying in an airplane, let's meet once a week virtually and uh, or once a day if we have to. But you can sit in your office, we can sit in ours. These are big screens. These are five by seven feet screen. Right. And there are two of them. One is for faces and one is for the drawings and the 3D models and so on. And mm-hmm. uh, we can actually interact more with you as our client this way than we could if we all climbed on airplanes once a month and flew to uh, across the ocean to Europe or to Asia. Right. Right. Um, and uh, this became for HOK quite routine. I think it's, uh, l- let's talk a little bit about HOK's culture, uh, particularly historically speaking, and yes. and, uh, uh, and, and and how, how that has changed over time. And you have yes. noted over here that uh, all of them, Helmo, Tobata, and Kasbon, were colorful characters in their own rights. Yes, and they that, were. <laughs> uh, that one of them drew up the bomb rack on the Enola Gay. That especially caught my eye. Uh, the firm was begun, was founded in St. Louis, Missouri, but the only one of the founders that was, that was actually from St. Louis was George Helmuth. He was the son of uh, an architect who practiced in St. Louis, Uh, around the turn of the 1900s. And his father and his uncle had a firm uh, called, of course, Helmuth and Helmuth Mm. that that did mansions for well-off St. Louisans. They did 
They were both Catholics, so they did a lot of work for the Catholic Church, and they did uh, uh, commercial buildings in St. Louis. The most uh, durable or famous of them, this is a little piece of history, um, is the uh, International Fur Exchange Building. Yes, by 1900, we were still trapping beavers and other animals, in, mostly in the West, and they were brought to St. Louis, originally by boat and later by rail, and the International Fur Exchange was where the furs were bought and sold. There was a big auction room, and there were uh, offices for the, the, the members of the fur exchange, so it's just like a stock exchange. Okay. And uh, that's probably their most notable work. But what young George Helmuth, the founder of HOK, learned as he was growing up is that his father and his uncle's firm was like a roller, he called it a roller coaster, up and down, up and down. They got a job, they hired some draftsmen. And uh, they worked on the job, they trained the draftsmen, and uh, each, each partner, each uh, of the brothers, designed and uh, marketed for work. But neither one of them liked to sell, they liked to design. So they would hold off designing, hold off selling the next job until the first one was almost finished. Sometimes they got new work to fill in behind and sometimes they did not. So they would, all the effort and they made to, to hire and train draftsmen so that they, they finally had a good operation, that was all lost if they didn't have new work. They had to lay everybody off and then go out and find some more work. It was just down to the two brothers again and then they would start over again with the next project. So young George Helmuth saw this when he was growing up and, and it, it, it really seared him. It was a, it was a dramatic experience for him. Mm -hmm. So he, he decided that he was going to figure out how to make a firm that, uh, that was how to make a firm that can survive a depression. He never worked for his father and uncle. They could never afford to hire him. And he eventually left St. Louis, moved to Detroit, and wrangled a job with Smith, Hinchman, and Grills. And Smith, Hinchman, and Grills were just busy designing assembly plants for, for the automobile companies. So they had work. And uh, George began as a designer, as I did, and then quickly uh, joined their solicitation department uh, because they, the, the, the partners at Smith, Hinchman, and Grills saw that he, was, he had a natural gift for, for selling. He wanted to be very scientific about it, so he wrote a 22-page paper about three or four things that you should do to make your firm recession or depression-proof. Mm -hmm. The first one was, don't just focus on one building type. He said, you have to learn how to design everything. And every, every design problem is an opportunity for a project and an opportunity to make your mark. Recessions and depressions are not uniform. Sometimes you'll have a slow period in, in Detroit, but boy, look at Chicago, it's just booming, or maybe Seattle. So his other idea was you should continue to diversify geographically. Uh, so diversify, diversify. And architecture is, is a good profession, but there are other design specialties. And why don't we diversify into those as well? Why don't we learn how to do some, uh, or hire some people that know how to do landscape architecture? planning, engineering for buildings, and then, and then later programming and so on, because there will always be something that a client needs. Be the jack of all trades. Helmuth, while he was at Smith Henchman at Grills, realized that they didn't have a good designer at that firm and persuaded them to let him hire a young Japanese-American architect uh, from Seattle, actually, uh, named Minoru Yamasaki, who at that time was working in New York City. So he recruited Yama, at, Yama always called him Yama, to Detroit. And uh, Yama began working with uh, Helmuth uh, on these projects and became a real celebrated designer for Smith Henchman. And eventually they broke off, he and Yamasaki and the, one of the top production architects, Harold Lineweber, they broke off and formed their own firm in Detroit, Helmuth, Yamasaki, and Lineweber. Uh -huh. That firm, uh, almost within days of its founding, Helmuth went back to St. Louis, where he was from, and opened 
a branch office in St. Louis because he knew everybody in St. Louis. So he marketed both cities at the same time. Uh, they got very busy with the airport, uh, with Helmuth won them the job to redesign, uh, to design new terminals for the St. Louis Lambert Airport. And uh, Yama, of course, was the designer. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful building that instead of the railroad age where we had big, heavy, long buildings made of stone, Richardsonian type buildings, this was light and arched uh, uh, concrete uh, that was filled with light. And uh, Yama designed it, but he, he had so much work to do between the two cities of Detroit and St. Louis. He asked, um, he asked one of his friends from uh, Cranbrook, who should I hire? I need a good young design assistant. And they said, well, you should hire young Gio Obata. And Gio Obata was also a Nisei like uh, Yamasaki. He was, that is, he was born in the U.S. Um, to immigrant Japanese parents. And yeah. uh, Obata uh, was working for SOM in Chicago. So he hired uh, Obata in Detroit, but within six months had moved Obata to St. Louis to work full time on the Lambert Airport project. And the St. Louis office needed a good top production architect. So they hired an, uh, a Washington University professor whose name was George Cassebaum. And George Cassebaum had grown up in Kansas, loved architecture, but found in college at university that he especially loved uh, the organizational work of putting together a building after the design had been uh, had been put forth. And uh, it was George Cassebaum that during the war spent his time working for the Boeing company and um, also at an Air Force base in Ohio. And he said, he, he, he told me he's sure that he drew up the bomb rack for the Enola Gay, but the Air <laughs> Force would never confirm it to him. It was a secret. I see. I see. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Gio Obata was born in San Francisco and raised in Berkeley. His father was a very well-known um, artist. In fact, right now they have some, they have a virtual show because the Smithsonian has a, a collection of his uh, paintings, uh, but they've had to turn it into a virtual show instead of a in-person show. But Kura Obata was a well-known artisan from Northern Japan who moved to California um, settled, raised his family, and became a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley. I see. And uh, uh, Gio, their son, uh, grew up, they always thought he would become an art artist because his mother um, was also an artist. She was a specialist in ikebana, the art of arranging, Jap Japanese art of flower arranging. So Obata uh, decided though that he, he liked math and science. He was a practical kind of guy. And so he decided he wanted to be an architect and enrolled at UC Berkeley in September, 1941 as a freshman. And in December of 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and World War II started. And the internment order came for all Japanese Americans that were living in one of the, in Washington, Oregon and California that right, they had right. to go to the camps with one provision that if you were a full-time student, university student, you could continue your studies, but not in the three Western states. Right, right. So that caused Gio Obata to, um, to uh, apply to other universities in the Midwest and the East. And the only school that accepted him was Washington University in St. Louis. Right, right. A small private university with a good reputation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I see. Uh, he, uh, he he came within 24 hours of being interned with his family. The telegram came from Washington University less than a day before they were supposed to be take the train to their internment camp. Uh, so think about this: a young Japanese American boy just graduated from high school, on his way to someplace he'd never been during the war years, when all the war feelings were strong. When he got to St. Louis, he found that the university, the faculty and the other students just adopted him. 
and uh, he fell in love with St. Louis and the university. He is the only one of the founders who's still living. And he's 96 and still lives in suburban St. Louis uh, really? with his fourth wife. Wow, that's interesting. That's so interesting. Those are the three guys. And um, Helmuth, in addition to diversi diversification, the other thing that Helmuth said in his strategy that was so important, I think, is that if you have, you should have partners and the partners should specialize instead of each partner as his father and uncle did, they both wanted to design buildings. They both wanted to market the next job. He said, no, you should specialize. Pick the partner that's best at design and he or she will become better if they focus on that as their, as their mm -hmm. craft, as their specialty. And Helmuth wanted to be a full-time marketer to our knowledge, he is the first principal or leader of a firm in the United States, at least, who became a full-time marketer when he and Yamasaki split uh, Helmuth, Yamasaki, and Leidenweber, and Helmuth took the St. Louis office and renamed it HOK and made Gio Obata and George Kassebaum his, his partners. Right. That occurred in 1955. What you have a lot of uh, history over there. You should write a complete uh, history book uh, on the firm. I'm sure. So, in concluding over here, as we are, you know, finishing up, or rounding out uh, our conversation here, uh, yes. let me say, uh, I presume this is what you mean by running towards trouble rather than sort of running away from it. Yes. Uh, and, and, and is this also, uh, how does this connect to your concept of positive peer pressure? I mean, how does yeah, positive okay. peer pressure work? So let's conclude with that discussion about positive Yes, okay. Pressure. Well, running toward trouble is simply this. Uh, if there is a problem, uh, maybe it's a client problem, maybe it's a personnel problem, or maybe it's a coronavirus problem, it does no good to uh, avoid it somehow, thinking, right. well, maybe it will go away if I leave it alone. Problems don't work that way. The little problems become big ones and big ones become um, catastrophic problems. So run toward trouble means square yourself up, take a hard look at the problem, do not be afraid, and find the right answers for you to go around or through the problem and get to the sunny side on the other side of it. And positive peer pressure? Yes, positive peer pressure basically says this. If you have a small firm or a large firm, um, people are all different. And uh, if you have benchmarks for performance, uh, how well you're doing financially, especially, it's very good if you can actually put, instead of keeping it a secret, we had open book. Everybody in the firm could see our numbers at the end of every month and see if uh, the Dallas office was doing what they were, what they had promised they would do in their, in their plan, or if the New York office was performing. And uh, instead of having uh, to go to these people myself and say, you know, you're underperforming, you simply have a board meeting. We had a board meeting every month virtual with a video conference. We put everybody's numbers up in front of each other. And then we would ask those that were underperforming, what are, what is your plan? How are you, What's the plan for you to run toward trouble and fix these problems and overcome them? And uh, it wasn't so much my asking, it was their peers in the other offices saying, well, okay, Joe, what are you doing about this? And how can we help you? Maybe they don't have enough work. Well, maybe we can share some of our work. Maybe they need a talented person. Maybe we can find, maybe they need to collect some money. Well, maybe we can help you with that. So peer pressure meant, I want to be a member of the team. I don't want to let my team down. So it's a right. teamwork thing. Mm -hmm. So run mm -hmm. toward trouble and teamwork are two things that I added to what the, uh, what the founders uh, began the firm with. I added certainly those two. Uh, well, you had a long and very successful career at, uh, at your case, Patrick. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm glad you wrote it all down in a book uh, and shared that with that community. Uh, uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you for coming on Architecture Talk as well. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. 
This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.